Hello and welcome. My name is Renee Kemp, and as Ms. Varner has already uh, told you, I'm here with the distinct pleasure of interviewing a gentleman whose face I know you recognize. This face has graced small screen and large for a good 30 years. 50. 50 years. Well, I didn't want to admit to more than 30. <laughs> but the fact is, you literally started in Berkeley. Uh, you were born here in Berkeley. Yeah. You had um, occasion to uh, star in the Amen Corner. You have been in Die Hard, in School Days, and other films. Your face and your voice are very distinctive. And we are so happy to have you back here in Berkeley. And we all know the Amen Corner. We know this. We are, we're so familiar with this whole idea of church mm. and church folk. So what are you hoping that people um, get from it that maybe they didn't get from reading the play or reading it or the first time they saw it? What do you hope they get from it by seeing it again in 2015? Um, I, I hope they get a, a, a sense of um, social camaraderie. The, the, uh, the, the play reminds me when I was a kid, when I, well, I was a kid, I was 23 years old playing an 18-year-old uh, when I did the play. I always looked younger than what I, and I guess I was just so naive and immature, more naive than anything else. But there is a sense of universality in which an individual has an opportunity to challenge themselves in a, in a, in a uh, family uh, circle, in a religious philosophy. Um, they, ref they uh, we cover those areas, you know, Margaret, uh, Sister Odessa saying, I, ca I, I ain't got no job, I can't pay for this, I can't pay our rent, or Margaret, you got to stand it. So from many different aspects, this play resonates that, and it's not just simply a s single um, just a, a single look at religion, but the sc scope of life itself within this little nucleus here on the stage in the mm -hmm. Amen Corner, justifiably so named by the writer James Baldwin, the Amen Corner. <laughs> you know, Berkeley is really still very much a hotbed oh, yes. of talent. Yes. And so can you talk about some of the challenges that maybe you faced and what you could say to young upcoming performers and potential directors such as yourself who might be at Berkeley High School even as we speak? For me to go to, come from where I came from, I went to Longfellow and that's where my downfall started. <laughs> I went to Longfellow. That's the downfall. And I resented it ever since, and I'm 73 years old. Now, what's Longfellow? It's an elementary school. Oh, okay. Here in Berkeley. Do you all know Longfellow? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they, for some reason, a teacher, because it was all, all white teachers. There were no black teachers. The only black teacher was Miss, Miss Acting. Uh -huh. Love Miss Acting. But she put me in a special class. And so I had to go through the the embarrassment of being referred to as stupid, not, really? and, and none of the kids wanted to play with me. Really? And um, so I was here from three to the eighth, third grade to the eighth grade, and I just told my mother and father, I said, Look, I gotta get, out. that is not me. We don't, I don't wanna play checkers all day. So Miss White, a lady, a counselor at Burbank Junior High School, they engaged the, 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 uh, the situ issue and put me in a regular class. And it was interesting, I was in a regular class and I remember a girl who'd been in a regular class the whole time and we were reading and the girl couldn't read the word such. And I said, I'm in a, they put me in a stupid class and she can't read the word such. <laughs> uh, but acting, unlike all the others, when you get out there and you're on this stage and that curtain comes up or those lights come on, there ain't no way you can make a, there's no way you can, you make, you gotta know everything, all your lines, you can't go back. Cause if you make a mistake, the audience will know five seconds after you've done it. You know, I, I know our haste is real and perhaps I'm a little bit too loquacious, but you're so provocative, I have no other recourse. <laughs> I think I just got complimented. <laughs> 
they, they had no idea. I didn't know I was going to be an actor until I was seven. And uh, they, I didn't tell anybody. I just enjoyed looking at movies and Sidney Poitier, whom is a very dear personal friend of mine for the past 30 years. And I'm very proud of that relationship with his family. But being here in Berkeley was kind of special. Everywhere I go in the world, I was just in, in over Europe, uh, and I was just relating some uh, experiences with you. But people, they know Berkeley. Since the 60s, Berkeley, in, 1960, in the 1960s, Berkeley's population was 168,000 people. It's one of the most versatile liberal cities. But of course, you know better because you live, you know, with the cities in this country and everybody in foreign countries, they know Berkeley. I'm in a pub, Mark, in, in England. I'm in a, in a pub in the blout size. Uh, where are you from, Mike? I says, I'm, I'm, I'm from America. Well, Port America, you're from. Uh, I'm from the West Coast. What poor old West Coast are you from, Mike? Okay, I'm from Berkeley. Berkeley, blokes from Berkeley, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Learning a script, I remember once I had a, the audition, and I had a page of dialogue, a page and a half of dialogue to commit to memory. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, it was Die Hard 2, and I had all this dialogue, and, and, it, was, and, and it cost 60 million, this scene, if we lost a day, that's sixty. That that's that's thirty five thousand dollars just for that scene. No pressure. So <laughs> they gave me the, the sides, and I had them all memorized. And then right when I was getting ready to shoot, they brought me another page yeah, with that dialogue and the new page with the dialogue interspersed between the lines. And that's thirty five thousand dollars for that particular set a day. And I couldn't complain because they were paying me well, you know. So I had to, they challenged me as an actor. And I remember once I was in a, doing a TV show and this one actor, he had the same pr situation where they, he thought he had four lines to memorize and he had a page and he had 45 minutes himself uh, to committed to memory and I watched him while everybody else was fooling around. I just, I didn't disturb him, I just watched him. Mm. And I said, I know that will probably happen to me someday and if it does. So I, I had to spend that time learning it and it took me 35 minutes, but I couldn't talk to anybody I couldn't make contact with anybody or any, because you have to stay focused. Yes. And that's what I want them to come here and take from the, but, but of course, I want this theater here to be the pivotal point for people to have uh, come and recognize the contributions that, that African Americans have made from Corrobri which is the first theater where they just round the campfires to sophisticated and modern theater that we have here. A lot of people don't understand what this, when I saw this stage for the first time, I said, well, cause I started in a little, the Amen Corner when it was first done, it was only done in, in not even half this space. Mm -hmm. Not even half this space. So often we hear in the media that we have no role models, but as the gentleman said earlier that you give so much back to the community, the fact that you're here directing, obviously there are role models. You're an actor, you're a director, you've done great things. How do we get the message to our young people so they don't try to reinvent the wheel, that we do have role models in our community that they can pull from? Thank you. Thank you. That is, I, I, I mean, I have to go to night school just to learn how to turn on and off my cell phone. <laughs> so, uh, but to try to get youngsters nowadays away from an electronic device, uh, it's, it's, that, that's a very interesting uh, problem 